This guy is the Reverend Jim Jones. A number of years ago, he started a group called the People's Temple. And their stated goal was that they were going to help the poor and the underprivileged and the sick of all races and economic classes. Sounds good on paper, but what was happening inside the group was widespread abuse. People who left the group reported him. Well, it got pretty tenuous, so he took his followers and they went to the jungles of Guyana. And there they wanted to start this tropical utopia. Well, the abuse claims he couldn't shake those, so some journalists and some government officials went over to check up on him. Well, they found bad stuff, but as they were trying to leave, they were shot and killed. And following that, Jim Jones and 931 followers, hundreds of which were children, drank Kool-Aid that was laced with cyanide, and they all died. I know this guy looks like a Harry Potter extra. It's not. His name is Luc Girat. He was a Belgian religious leader, and he was a neo-Nazi. And he started a group, and it was under the guise of Christianity. His group was called the Knights of the Solar Temple. And their whole thing was that Jesus would return, and he would reestablish the Knights Templar. Now, they believed a lot of wacky, crazy things, but it really wasn't dangerous to anybody until, in 1984, members of this group, including Gerard himself, feared that one lady had given birth to the Antichrist, so they killed the child. And not long after that, pretty much the whole group, including Gerard himself, committed suicide. If you believe If you believe that most religions were spawned by aliens, that mind transfer is possible, and that cloning is a way to carry on reincarnation, you might be a candidate for the Raelian church. This was started in the 70s in France, and again, a lot of weird stuff. You can just tell by their building alone. Probably the biggest thing that came out of the Raelian church is that there was a lady who tried to get the message around the world that she had conceived the first ever cloned human being. And I'm not quite sure how that even works. One more. Marshall Applewhite was a leader of a group known as the Heaven's Gate Cult. They believed that the earth was going to be recycled, meaning everything was going to be burned up. And the only way to escape it was to hitch a ride on the Hale-Bopp comet that was coming near earth. So when it got close enough... Applewhite and his followers, in shifts, drank a bunch of poison in a California mansion, and they all died. And when authorities went in, they found people all wearing the Nike shoes and having armbands that said, Heaven's Gate Awaiting. Now, sadly, we could go on and on because every year there's a group or a sect or a cult that does weird stuff or does atrocious things. And I don't know about you, but I read about these things and one question comes to mind. How? How in the world could someone get caught up in this? How could rational people be duped by these guys who are obviously whack jobs who are just completely out of their mind? How could a sane person throw in with stuff like this? Mass suicide? Child sacrifice? Riding on a comet? These things happen, and again, the question that comes to mind is this. How? How can somebody buy into this? Now, today, it's Christ the King Sunday. And I think that title is pretty self-explanatory. Christ is our King. He's always been our King. He will always be our King. We are His subjects. He is our Lord. He is our Master. He is our Ruler. Well, that makes total sense to us, but do you realize a lot of people see us the way we see those cult members we just talked about? Think about it this way. People look at us and they say, you believe in someone you've never seen before. And someone who's given no proof of his existence or his deity. You base everything that you believe on a book that was finished 2,000 years ago. And this one, you say, is always with you because he has all power, even though, again, he's offered you no no proof of his existence. You believe that a Jewish guy dying on the other side of the world 2,000 years ago means that when your time is up, because you believe in him, you'll have this paradise in the sky where all your deepest desires will be fulfilled. They look at us like we are brainwashed cult members. And keep going. 
We believe that we come to church and a child is brought to a place like this. There's some water and some words and suddenly that child is transformed. We gather together twice a month to eat the body and drink the blood of our dear leader. And to that point, I found a quote. Somebody trying to be funny. Jesus Christ, who as it turns out was born of a virgin, cheated death and rose bodily into the heavens, can now be eaten in the form of a cracker. Just taking a pot shot, saying that's just ridiculous. They look at us and say, you oddly gather in a building and you all face one way and you sing songs to this dear leader. And above all, you are willing to part with precious money and precious time in service to this dear leader. Again, from their perspective, we have drank the Kool-Aid. We have bought into something that just isn't true. Maybe you've heard of this. Flying spaghetti monster. Does that ring a bell with anybody? And it's an actual thing. Atheists came up with it, I believe it was in the 70s. And the whole point is to say, well, why not believe in a flying spaghetti monster if you're going to believe in God? Because from their perspective, it's the same thing. Neither God nor flying spaghetti monster exist, and both God and flying spaghetti monster are figments of man's imagination. Now, whether you're reading an article online or maybe you're having a conversation or you see it on some show where Christianity is presented this way, what's your natural w- thought of how to respond? If you're anything like me, you get mad, you get frustrated, you get defensive because we know the truth, right? It's got to be true. I mean, we've known that our whole life. Yes, yes, yes. What we believe is true. But what happens at the end of the day when we're in bed and everything is shut down except our brains? That's when the questioning starts, right? That's when we start wondering, am I like those cult members? Have I bought into a lie? Have I been tricked into believing something that really isn't true? Do I only believe this Jesus thing because my parents crammed it down my throat? Do I only believe in Jesus because it gives me a sense of purpose and hope in an otherwise pretty hopeless world? Am I just like those people that we talked about before? I don't like to admit it, but at times I have those questions. They may not last long, but they're there. And I know that you're not really that different. So, do you need a shot in the arm that you haven't been duped? Do you need a reminder that what you hold to is the truth? Do you need the encouragement that you aren't some brainwashed cult member who's just believing something because somebody told you to believe it? Do you want to hear more about Christ your King? Well, if that's you, then there's good news for you. And that good news comes straight from our Lord. We're in the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, God gives Daniel short and long-term prophecies. A lot of the short-term ones, they were fulfilled pretty quickly. But the one we're focusing on is a long-term prophecy. It deals with the end. It deals with Judgment Day. So what does Daniel say? He says, Is my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. Okay, so who is this? Well, son of man, Jesus uses that phrase over 80 times to refer to himself in the Gospels. He's stressing that he's not only true God, but he's also true man, able to go to the cross for us. And the part about coming on the clouds of heaven, Jesus said this in Matthew. I say to all of you, from now on you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. So God is making it clear to Daniel and to us that the one that Daniel sees in this vision, it is Jesus, the Son of Man, riding on the clouds. Okay, keep going. He, Jesus, approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. Now, Ancient of Days, you can probably figure out what that means. It's just stressing that God always has been, he is now, and he always will be. And it says that he, Jesus, the Son of Man, was led into his presence. And that's a huge point. Think in the Bible, we got Christmas coming up. There's angel visits all over the Christmas account. People see an angel, an angel that simply reflects God's holiness, and they hit the deck. They're terrified. They cover their eyes. And there are other times in Scripture where people either want to see God or God mentions uh, about meeting him and says, you can't. You cannot look on me and live. Sinners cannot gaze upon a holy God. But the Son of Man can Because the sin that prohibits it, he doesn't have any of it. There was and always will be perfect communion between the Father and the Son. 
Now, maybe you're thinking, okay, great, good reminder of who Jesus is, but what does this have to do with all those doubts we were talking about before? Well, keep going. Daniel says, He, the Son of Man, Jesus, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. That almost sounds like too simple of a way of saying it, that Jesus has all might and authority and power. So maybe making it concrete will help. Think about Jesus' power. What power does he have? What can he do? Anything. Like saving people, like giving sight to the blind, like changing water into wine, like walking on water, like driving out demons and raising the dead? Yes, exactly like that. His power is unlimited. There's nothing he cannot do. What about his authority? Well, there is no higher authority. Jesus answers to no one. There's no one who ranks above him, some king of this world. Even Satan is on his leash. Wherever Jesus goes, he belongs because he has all authority. And the glory part? Yes, Jesus humbled himself and hid that glory in order to be our Savior. But what's more glorious than rising from the dead? What's more glorious than ascending into heaven? What's more glorious than sitting at the right hand of the Father? What is more glorious than ruling all things for all time for the good of God's people? Again, it sounds almost like too simple of a way to say it. But this is who Jesus is and what he does. And in time, everybody will see this. Daniel says, All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. A time will come when there won't be any disputes about Jesus' claim to be the Savior, the King of heaven and earth. Everybody will know it because they will see it with their own eyes. And when all that happens, Daniel then tells us how things end, or really, how things begin. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. He's talking about heaven, the home for believers. Every other kingdom that this world has known, it has fallen or it will fall, but not the kingdom of our Savior, not the kingdom of our truest king. It will last forever and ever and ever, and we will be there with him. So does that help a little bit? You know, we have some doubts, but then to go back in and see even an Old Testament prophecy saying, this is who Jesus is, doesn't it put a little bit of steel in our spines to know that God is right and the Bible is right and therefore by extension we are right? Yes. But maybe this thought comes to mind. But I still have questions now. I still struggle with doubt at this moment. That's talking about the future. That's great. It's good to know. But what about right now? What has God done for me? What has God given to me that's going to help me in those times that I think I've been duped or suckered or that I feel like a cult member? What do we do? Well, it may sound too simple, but the answer is truly simple. We need to cling to the word. We will have doubts and concerns and questions until the day we die. That's just the nature of being an imperfect human being. But God has not left us defenseless. He didn't just say, good luck with that. He has given us everything we need to keep fighting the good fight of faith. He has given us everything to help us to continue to move forward. Like what? What has he done for us? Well, however old you are, go back that many years minus a few days. At a place like this, or maybe this exact place, someone brought you forward, most likely your parents. And there, through the power of the word, What happened? God put a believing heart of faith in your chest. You couldn't rationalize it. You couldn't talk about it. It didn't make logical sense to you. But in your heart of heart, you knew as a baptized child of God that Jesus was your Savior. Again, we couldn't make sense of it, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. It did happen because God says so. And with that heart of faith, ever since then, you have known the truth. The truth that Jesus is your Lord that you are forgiven and loved, that the Lord is merciful and gracious and compassionate, and that he will always be with you. That's how things started, that huge moment of you being brought into God's family. But it didn't stop there. God brought person after person into your life to help you to understand that what you believe is true. First and foremost, parents did the heavy lifting. They taught you God's word. They prayed with you. They modeled the faith for you. They brought you here to catechism and church and Sunday school and all those good things. And when you were here, maybe God used other people. Maybe it was a pastor in the past or a staff member or something like that. Maybe it was a concerned 
Christian friend who was there to help and guide you. Maybe it was just somebody you sat next to in Bible class who gave you that oomph, who told a story that shared with you the message, the power of God's amazing love. The point is that God used person after person after person after person after person. <laughs> and we truly could go on all morning because that's what he's done. He's brought so many people into your life. And what do all those people do? Where do they all point you? They point you back to the word. The basis for what you believe, the basis for the heart of faith that's in you. And not only has God given us that word, he has promised that his spirit will work through that word. And what will the spirit do? He will remind us of what we already know. He will remind us that what we believe and what the Bible says is true. He will help us to understand that we haven't been duped or suckered or we just believe this because mom and dad did. He will help us to understand that there is one truth and by God's grace, we believe it. And when we focus on that one truth, especially the truth of our Savior's love, the Spirit fills us with the confidence as we move forward because we know that whatever happens, our Lord will be there to guide and forgive and lead and reassure and all that we need Him to do. And in time, He will take us to our home in heaven. This isn't some story, it's not some trick. And you're not cult members who have drank the Kool-Aid. You know and believe the truth because at your baptisms and every time we gather around the word, God convicts you of that truth. The truth of your Savior and the truth of his love. Now, are we still going to have doubts from here on out? Yeah. Are the attacks against our Lord, the flying spaghetti monster kind of stuff, are those going to increase? Probably. Is it going to be a difficult fight at times? Pretty safe to say, absolutely. But again, our Lord has not left us defenseless. We have him, we have his word, we have the spirit working through that word, we we have believer after believer after believer to encourage us in the truth that we all already know. And at the foundation of all these encouragements is God's word. Through that word, God will convince us that we're not duped morons who have bought into a cult. He will convince us that by God's grace, we know the truth, a truth that sets us free, a truth that sets us at ease. And it, sets, and it does that because at the center of that word, at the center of that truth is Christ our King. He fought every battle that needed to be fought. He won every battle he fought and the spoils of victory, now and eternally, are ours. Keep your focus on him. He's your Lord. He's your King. And being with him, you never need to be afraid. You never need to doubt. Amen.